I'm Kathleen Baxter from the Anoka County Library. Welcome to Northern Lights and Insights. Our guests today are Carolyn Strom Collins and Christina Wiss Erickson, the co-authors of the Anne of Green Gables Treasury. Um, I'm always fascinated by people who collaborate on a book, and I'm wondering how you two ever met and how you decided to write the Anne of Green Gables Treasury, which is a delightful, wonderful, beautiful book. Oh, th thank you. We've been friends for a long time, for years and years. We met at a school bus stop. We were putting both of our first born children on the bus for their first grade uh, day at school, first day at school. And as we were wiping the tears from our eyes, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, met each other and we've been friends ever since. And uh, we've done lots of fun experiment, uh, fun things together and um, this book is sort of the culmination of all that. Where are you from originally? Did you meet in Minnesota? Are you from Minnesota? I'm from South Carolina, but I've lived here since uh, 1979. And I'm from Indiana, but I moved here from Virginia, so I've lived here for 16 years. And that's one of the things that Carolyn and I had in common right away. We were both transplants mm -hmm. to Minneapolis, so we kind of consoled each other. And <laughs> <laughs> we were both a little homesick for warmer climes <laughs> so at that right. point. And sometimes that still happens. But uh, that was one of the things that brought us together. And then, um, as she said, we've been through a lot of projects over the years. But early on, we discovered that we were both very enthusiastic about children's literature and children's classics in general. So we shared that interest. Was this book the first thing you did together, or did you write articles? Has anything else of yours been published prior to writing the book? Or was this your first shot at it? <laughs> no, this was actually our first shot at publishing a book. Um, Carolyn and I had been in a stationary business together earlier on, and we did do a little. It was in the get organized mode of the 1980s when that was a very popular <laughs> thing, and we did write on wipe off weekly and monthly planners, more for um, business and school use. And, and we also did a little Christmas planner that was sold for instance, in Hallmark stores and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that was the little mini book that started us out on our literary career. But uh, this book grew out of our, our just more of a hobby type love of children's books and children's classics. But how do you decide to write this, the Anne of Green Gables Treasury? I mean, how, how did you come up with this idea? Was it before or after the marvelous television series that we were all crazy about? Or did you read the book before that time? Did you love the book before that time? Well, how did you decide to do this? We had both read Anne of Green Gables series as well as all the other classics when we were children, and this was one of our favorites. Um, the way the book came about as I say, Carolyn and I get into so, so many things together. We're both, what I'd say, serious gardeners. We were so into the Anne books when our girls were reading them around the ages of 13 and 14. We read them along with our girls because we like to be able to discuss what they're reading with them. Well, Carolyn started noticing all the wonderful flowers that Anne talked about. You know, she had a very enthusiastic love of nature and of flowers. And the, some of the flowers we didn't know about. We tried to incorporate as many of them as we could in our own gardens at home, but some of the flowers we didn't know about. So um, Carolyn actually started trying to catalog the flowers, the Ann flowers. She's a librarian, <laughs> by the way. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cataloger and from way she's back. She's a cataloger <laughs> at heart. Did you do this on the computer or on note cards? <laughs> oh, on well, note cards. She started on note cards. <laughs> and okay. the, the book grew out of the gardening chapter, what is now the gardening chapter of the book. We started out of an interest in the flowers, and then there were additional questions from our daughters on, well, what, what was the... What was it like to cook on a wood stove? What was life generally like in those days, a hundred years ago? So we did a bit of researching about the times to answer their questions. And then Carolyn can tell you how that other chapter grew. 
<laughs> well, we did put a timeline in the book because we wanted to calculate the dates that Anne would have been alive if she'd been a real character. And we have to keep reminding ourselves that she was a fictional character uh, and not a real person. But uh, if you get into books like this, you, you start assuming that she really was a real person. And that's the assumption that we worked with a lot of the time. And we started to calculate her dates. Um, and there, there's some uh, discrepancy about that but among the Ellen Montgomery scholars. but um, we calculated Anne's dates from the last book in the series, which is Rilla of Ingleside, and that is set in the First World War. And we calculated backwards from 1919 uh, back to the very beginning of the Anne books, which is Anne of Green Gables. And uh, we calculated that she was born in 1866. So her, her span of 54 years through the Anne series um, created some interest with us as to what was going on during that period in the real world, mm -hmm. uh, not just in Prince Edward Island, Canada, where the story is set, and not just in Avonlea, where Anne grew up, but what was going on in the rest of the world during that time. And we discovered all sorts of interesting things were going on. It was, she was born a year after the uh, Civil War ended in the United States, and after that um, was a very, very interesting period in American history and in world history, uh, lots of inventions. Edison was inventing all of his wonderful things, the phonograph and the light bulb, and, and Alexander Graham Bell was coming up with the telephone, and um, Eastman was coming up with a Kodak camera, and the ivory soap people were <laughs> <laughs> cranking out <laughs> bars of soap, and the candy bar, and the teddy bear, and chewing gum, and Cracker Jacks. And, products that we're familiar with today were being started back then. And so that was a, another uh, avenue that our interest took, was just finding out about all those things. But then, okay, you've got all this interest, but mm -hmm. then how do you decide, I'm going to write a book, we're going to write a book together? Well, we, we finally discovered that we had so many interesting bits of information uh, that we thought people that are so um, in love with the Anne books would want to know more about the background. Um, surrounding the books, more about what life was really like, what was going on, and what Anne's life would have, would have been like in the 1800s, how she would have grown up and what she would have had to deal with. And we thought that other people would be interested in learning about that. Mm -hmm. And we proceeded from there. We just got a germ of an idea and thought, well, this might make a book. Um, well, we and actually. Would you like to work on a book about Anne of Green Gables? <laughs> oh, I'd love to work on a book we about actually, Anne of Green Gables. But we actually didn't write the book until we knew that there might be a market for it because we had um, given the idea to a friend who is a literary agent, and she thought it, it was a good idea and that we should go ahead with it. That's why we wrote the proposal. We didn't write the book first and then try to sell it. Mm -hmm. We had done some collecting, as I said. We picked out the flowers from the eight books and some of the um, inventions, as Carolyn said, and, and talked about the recipes and the crafts that Anne was doing throughout the eight, series of eight books, but we hadn't written a whole book. We outlined it. We, we picked uh, topics that we thought <coughs> readers would enjoy mm -hmm. learning about, and, and we also picked things that we knew were in the books that we could draw out and make chapters on. Now, did you do most of your research here in Minnesota, or did you end up ultimately, there's a lot of thank yous in here too, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. in Canada, to people at Prince Edward Island itself. Did you go to Prince Edward Island and research? Oh, sure, or? yeah. We went there in 1987, I believe it was. That's right. For our first trip to Prince Edward Island. Um, one of our main concerns for this book was that uh, we have authentic details in it, and we wanted them to be accurate. And we wanted uh, whoever illustrated the book to be doing the illustrations based directly on Green Gables itself because there is really a Green Gables house. It's part of a national park on Prince Edward Island and they preserved it and um, decorated it in the manner that Ellen Montgomery, the author, talks about in the books. And um, so we wanted our readers to know what that house looks like and um, not be disappointed when they get there and say, oh, well, this is not the way, <laughs> this is not the, the book, I mean, the house in the book, this is not the house in the movie, um, we wanted them to know exactly the house that she grew up in. And Were your so husband supportive of this, or did your whole family go on the trip? <laughs> <laughs> they were supportive. They, they didn't go with they us. They were very <laughs> supportive, but no, they didn't go with us to do research because it really was very, very long and painstaking. We visited many, many libraries and historical societies and archives and 
uh, flower farms in Prince Edward Island, and, and we really, as Carolyn said, were very painstaking with the authenticity. And everything in our book does reflect the period accurately. One thing we wanted to do was find, see if we could find a copy of Anne's teaching certificate, or a, a, a teaching certificate mm -hmm. that she would have received, because that's part of the first book, was her, her um, dedication to learning, and one of her goals was to become a teacher, and she had to take the entrance exams and finally uh, go to Teachers College and receive her teaching degree. So we did find an actual copy of a teaching certificate, and um, so we had, had our artist make that Ann Shirley certificate in the book so that our readers could see what her certificate would have looked like. Did you get any input into the artist who did the pictures for the book? Well, we had uh, approval over the pictures, which is very nice, which a lot of times authors don't get, even if they're not first-time authors. But uh, we had that, and we asked for that because, as I said, we wanted everything to really be authentic down to the door hinges. And we did end up with a very good product in that way. All the illustrations are very accurate. There's a floor plan in our book of Green Gables, and it's furnished just the way Green Gables is furnished now by Parks Canada, all according to the descriptions in the Anne of Green Gables books. So I hope that our reader can walk into our book and experience Anne's world just as if she were taking a trip to Prince Edward Island. Did you, um, <coughs> my mind just went blank on this, you've got a bunch of artifacts along with us right here. Mm -hmm, you want to mm -hmm. describe some of the things you've bought? They look quite interesting. Well, the, the point of this uh, table full of artifacts is to illustrate all of the different things that were being invented during Anne's time. And uh, you can see earmuffs and cornflakes. Well, the only reason they go together on this <laughs> table is because they were being invented during, <laughs> during the period of history that Anne um, was, would have been alive. The teddy bear was 1903, and Anne would have been, oh, I think about 35 years old when that was a minute. So she grew up without a teddy bear to, to hug at night, but uh, maybe her children had, had teddy bears. Um, Edison and his light bulb, and here's one of Edison's old records. There were, there were uh, cylinders at that period, and we picked one of those up. Animal crackers, cracker jacks. Um, the, a lot of electrical appliances were being invented during that time. <coughs> the iron, the toaster, the carpet, uh, vacuum cleaners, all those things were, were being developed during her, her lifetime. So that's why we have this table of artifacts. And on the other side, I think you have craft items and mm. tea things. Yes, so. these are examples of the crafts that we wrote about and put in our book. Some of the things from the eight Anne books that were drawn from the eight Anne books. And as I said, Anne was, of course, a great lover of flowers. And one of the things that she would do, and they did in Victorian times, which was during this time span, is dry flower petals and make potpourri. And then they would scent, put bowls into rooms to scent the rooms, and also make little sachets for their drawers and also for gifts. This is an example of Anne's flowered hat, which anybody who's read Anne of Green Gables <laughs> will remember that on her way to the Sunday school, she scandalized the whole congregation by picking roses and buttercups and putting them on her hat and walking down the aisle in church and letting everyone see her with her hat on. Let's see, this is a button string, which was one of the very popular pastimes. The young girls collected buttons and traded them back and forth. And the goal was to reach a thousand buttons because they thought which would be a very long book. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> they thought that when they reached a thousand buttons, they'd know who they were going to marry. Mm. <laughs> now this person has a long way to go. This is an example of a baby hat, which can be made from a handkerchief. Hmm. And the instructions for this are also in our book. And it's folded, the handkerchief is folded and gathered in the back and just tied with a little bit of thread. and two little ribbons attached to make the baby bonnet. And when the little baby grows up, if it's a girl, she can undo this little end and take the ties off and carry the handkerchief in her wedding. Oh, that's a brilliant which idea. Which is a nice <laughs> sentimental Victorian idea. <laughs> 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 and we also have a little ribbon apron with some crocheted edging in our book, if you can see the crochet mm -hmm. here. Even very young girls did what we would think of today as very sophisticated needlework. They learned how to make lace, they learned how to crochet, 
and to sew all, of course, made all of their clothes, especially girls who lived in the country as Anne did. And they didn't have a lot of clothes. They had maybe one or two dresses. They would have a school, a couple of school dresses and a good dress for church on Sunday. So the aprons were pretty, but they were also practical. They did protect their everyday clothes, and they wore them to school too. Here's a little pressed flower bookmark, and there's also a pressed flower picture over there, which was something that Ann would have done too. And all you need to do this craft is a telephone book and some flowers and <laughs> press, them, press them flat and arrange pictures or bookmarks or placemats or whatever you might like to do. But it's a nice way to remember a special garden or a special place or a special day that you've spent outside. Now, Lucy Maud Montgomery was not Anne of Green Gables, although we would wish that it was so. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, there are certain things about her that are very similar to Anne, aren't mm -hmm. there? Could you tell us about some of those, their similarities? Mm -hmm. There are quite a few parallels. She always claimed that Anne was not an autobiographical character, but uh, there's so many parallels between their stories that you can't help but uh, assume that it is a lot of her story. Um, she had it set in Avonlea, which is in actuality Cavendish, Prince Edward Island. And uh, if you go there, you can find just about every building or spot that she talks about in the book. There's, there's a lover's lane, which Anne loved to, to walk in. There is uh, the Dryad's Bubble and the Babbling Brook. There's the Haunted Wood that you can walk through and, and feel like there's a ghost coming out at you at any minute, especially if you walk <laughs> through there at dusk. <laughs> um, all kinds of, of um, sites that are mentioned in the Anne books are still there. Well, you told me earlier that you had located Mrs. Rachel Lynn's house. Yes. How did you locate did. Mrs. Rachel Lynn's <laughs> house? <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of hard research. <laughs> <laughs> no, we discovered that Mrs. Rachel Lynn's house is on the corner, just as it's described in the Anne books, except um, just as they do with lots of buildings on Prince Edward Island, it's been moved. And in, in this particular case, it's been moved across the road and turned around, and it's been um, uh, transformed into a bed and breakfast. So if you go there, you can actually stay in Mrs. Rachel Lynn's house if you want to. <laughs> How did you determine it was Mrs. Rachel Lynn's house? Just well, we just, uh, we discovered it when we were there. People were talking about, oh, did you know that this house over here was <laughs> Mrs. Rachel Lynn's house? And I said, no, but tell us more. <laughs> now, you've been there how many times? Twice. And in the summer of 1992, which mm -hmm. is this summer mm -hmm. as we did say this, mm -hmm. um, you led a tour. How, mm -hmm. how was that? What was that like? Oh, it was lots of fun. And we um, met so many people that are deeply interested in Ellen Montgomery and her work, um, the Anne books in particular, of course. But uh, she did so many other things as well. She wrote about 20 to 22 books, 500 or more short stories, and uh, uh, hundreds of poems. She was a very prolific writer. She also wrote a daily journal and lots of uh, correspondence that um, we've been able to track down. Um, so you can find her journals in print and read about her life um, through those, uh, as well as her letters. Are most of her books still available if we want yes. to read them in the United States? They st they're even available? Most of them are in, are in print now. I know for a long time you could not buy very mm -hmm. many of her books. Well, there's been a renewal of interest. Uh, the um, television production uh, created a lot of interest in the Anne books, and then through those, people wanted to read more of Ellen Montgomery's work. So I think just about all of her books are now available in print. I think so. Maybe not every last one in the United States, mm -hmm. but there were a few in Canada that aren't available here, but very few. I most think you could get them. most of them in now, paperback. One thing I, I was also <coughs> once in Prince Edward Island, and um, they had uh, a beer, it wasn't a beer, a bookcase or something that she looked in, the Alan mm -hmm. Montgomery, or Maud, they called mm -hmm. her, right? Mm -hmm. Looked in and saw Katie Morris. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's and right. she used that incident in the end book. And she That's wrote right. that. I'm yeah. just wondering if there are other things like that that she wove into it from her own oh, life. Oh, sure. Just so many things. She, the furniture, um, a lot of the furniture that's now in Green Gables belonged to the family. Um, and so they gathered some of those things for that house. Um, there are several houses on the island that are open to the public that uh, had something to do with Ellen Montgomery. Um, so, so you can spot lots of different things. There's a story in which she um, uses a blue chest as um, a theme, and you can, you can see the blue chest on Prince Edward Island at the Anne of Green Gables Museum, which is different from Green Gables, but um, 
And you can see the bookcase, as you mentioned, and the Waterloo stove that Anne sat by to do her, her studies, <laughs> and the kitchen of Green Gables is there. Uh, There's a the Gog and Magog. Have you heard of Gog and Magog? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something that Ellen Montgomery did own that, that she had also written about in Anne of Green Gables. Not in Anne of Green Gables, but in when Anne was going to school and lived at the little house called Patty's Place. And what they are are two little china dogs that sit up on the mantle of the fireplace. And I think Gog looks to the right and Magog looks to the left, and that's how you can tell them apart. But those actually did exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a great story about those. Did you? I, I read it in a biography about her son. Um, somebody was visiting their house and asked about those two china. And he said, oh, that's God and my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Ellen Montgomery herself believed her father told her some, somehow she got the idea when she was little that um, they would jump off, off the mantle when the clock struck mid midnight and run around the room and bark and then jump back up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, was, I don't know. I think she did stay up one night to see if that would happen and was crushed what it did. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, she lived yeah. not on Prince Edward Island for most of her life. Didn't she moved away? Well, she moved. She married when she was about 36 years old, I believe it was. Uh, up until then, she had lived on Prince Edward Island with her grandparents. She was an orphan. Um, her mother died when she was about 18 months old, and then her father left her in the care of her mother's parents. Um, and that's a, that's a long story, but she did live with them until she was well into her 30s, and only left the island a time or two to um, go elsewhere to live, maybe for a year at the time. Oh, so even after her marriage, she lived on after the After her marriage, she moved away from mm -hmm. the island. But she's buried there. Yes, she can. is. Mm -hmm. They brought her back. See her grave. Have you mm -hmm. read that there's big controversy about whether they should put Anne on the license plates of Prince Edward Island? Yes, we heard that recently. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's a good idea? <laughs> well, in our book, we requested they not show Anne's face because we thought every, every reader has their own vision of Anne. And so we requested that the artist paint her turned away from the reader so that the reader would still have her in her imagination. And we hope they'll do that with a license plate as well instead <laughs> of trying to, to put a face on her. What do you think of the island today? I, oh, you, it's lovely. It's, it's a beautiful spot. It's, it's just so many, yeah, so many beautiful views. You can, see, you can see the ocean just about anywhere you are on the island or a glimpse of it. And there's so many uh, beautiful fields and trees. And uh, it's just, it, it lives up to its name of, of a jewel in the Atlantic, I think. It does seem to be Anne's home very much. I yes. mean, that's the number yeah. one thing that yeah. you find out about Prince Edward Island right. if you go there. <laughs> Everything is Anne of Green Gables. You can go to Matthew's it. Pizza and Marilla's. Mm. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite unusual, but right. it, it's a delightful place to visit. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do other tours there? How well, often have so. you been there all together? How many times? We've just, been there twice. twice. But we do hope to, to take tours back because there's so, so many people that are really interested in finding as much as they can about uh, Anne of Green Gables and Ellen Montgomery. And there's so much to see there that um, we hope to, to lead many tours there. Now, you have started the Ellen Montgomery S Literary Society. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we you tell have. us about that, some about that? Well, we just meet four times a year with people who are interested in exploring Ellen Montgomery's work. And we have, um, we have about 50 members so far. And uh, we'd love to, for anybody who's, who's deeply interested in learning more and talking with people who are interested in Ellen Montgomery to join us. How, could, how could people join you? What would be the best way? Well, probably the best way would be to phone me. What do you do at your meetings? We talk a lot about uh, our experiences with the different books that Ella Montgomery wrote and what we think about them. Um, we had one woman um, give a talk on the feminist side of Ella Montgomery's work, and that was interesting. We had a man who gave a talk on the Emily series last year because there, there are three books in the Emily series that Ella Montgomery wrote that um, he wanted to talk about. So he gave us a real interesting viewpoint on the Emily books. They're quite autobiographical as well. Um, we talk about the different books, the different stories. Um, if we've been to Prince Edward Island, we compare notes on the island and where to stay and where to eat and where to go to find <laughs> the <laughs> spots that Ella Montgomery would have known. Um, we discovered lots of new places when we were there this time and people have told us to oh be sure to see this that and the other so it's just a nice way to get to know other people's interests and and compare notes
we're fond of having tea also <laughs> and sampling <laughs> some of the wonderful cookies and breads and things that that are talked about in the Anne of Green Gables books too. Um, when you go to Prince Edward Island, what what's your favorite place? Do you have a favorite place? Do you, where is it? I, <laughs> I do. I, my favorite place is Lover's Lane, which is the little lane that runs back along um, a brook in back of uh, Green Gables. And it walks through some beautiful woods and there are some little benches that you can sit and think. <laughs> and it's just, it's a place where I really feel Ellen Montgomery's spirit because I, I know that she walked there many times and it was a place of comfort to her and it's quiet and it's just beautiful. That was her favorite spot in all the world, I think. One of my favorite places to go was the homestead, the site of the homestead of where she grew up. It's just across the road from Green Gables. And that's another place where you can mm -hmm. feel you really feel Ella Montgomery's spirit there. Mm -hmm. uh, the trees are there, the foundation of her home, so you can get an idea of the kinds of um, scenery she was looking at when she wrote her books. Um, it just, it means a lot to just be in the place that you knew she was in. You that can was see her the old inspiration. Yeah, you can see the old red lane that she walked to school. And, and of and course back. she named everything. She named every tree. She named one uh, big birch tree, the White Lady, and you look around and you wonder, I wonder if that was the white lady. <laughs> <laughs> she named, Anne named the little geranium on the windowsill in the kitchen, Bonnie. And El that was really autobiographical because Ellen did the same thing. She named just everything in nature that was around her. It was wonderful. Now she does have descendants alive today, isn't mm -hmm. that yes, correct? Yes, she does. She had mm -hmm. How many children family. did she have? And did she have a happy life after she left Prince Edward Island, do you think? Well, she had her ups and downs. <laughs> I would not say she had a very happy life. <laughs> she did have two children, and of course she loved them very much. Um, she was married to um, a minister who was a very well-respected man in the community, and she also had a very deep friendship with, with several women and with a man, Mr. McMillan, in Scotland that she wrote to for many years. She, her husband had a problem with depression that we realize now today called depression. In those days, I, I don't know if they just thought somebody was melancholy or what they, how they perceived it, but, but that was, really was a weight throughout her life. She did have to deal with that. But I think basically she's brought happiness to a heck of a lot of people <laughs> all over the world, and so have you in writing this delightful book. I uh, thank you for being with us today, Carolyn well, thank you. and Christina. Thank you. And join us again next week for Northern Lights and Insights. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency.